hole in the wall of the tunnel, but they forgot it was there. This allowed water from the river to flood into the basements of a bunch of our downtown office buildings. There's up to 40 feet of water in some of those basements. Fish were seen swimming in the basement of the merchandise mart. It caused almost $2 billion worth of damage. Called the Chicago Flood in 1992. Started right here. This spot was Batman. I recognize this next stone building ahead on the right. And then we're in the dark night. That was the Gotham City Ramp. The ice in the beginning of the dark night. The school bus is was filmed right here. The Joker and his henchmen took zip lines. The glass building came before. On the roof of that stone building. That stone building is actually the old main post office, 1932. At the time of its completion, it was the largest post office in the world. Why Chicago needs a big post office? Well, it used to be a major hub for mail order catalogs. You were going to put Sears catalog back in the day. This good chance it's processed and it's built. In 2016, the developer spent $900 million to turn this into corporate homes. And they turned the roof of this building into a crazy apartment. They opened that up. They're basketball courts. stars of Chicago, or that time we accused a cow of arson. Now it's a long story, and to tell it, I need to take a long sip of water. started, where we accused a cow of arson, that's now where we train firefighters. So, 
Our captain's gonna do another U-turn. That's an old steam plant. It's a power plant from the 1930s. It's been out of use since 2011, and it's not in great shape, so they kind of want to tear it down. But it's in a tricky spot to demolish. It's got the river on one side and train tracks on the other side. Those Amtrak and Metro trains don't want to stop running to let them tear it down. So it's still kind of in limbo. We are more in danger of the store goes. But as we tear it, you can join look at one of our power plants from the 1930s. Great to have these pictures as well. My name is Michael. If you have any other questions, I'll be back with Mike after we turn around. All right, then we'll turn around and head way down the South Branch and see the Willis Tower on the way back. Straight ahead, it is built with the big arch at the bottom, River Point from 2017. It's built directly above active Amtrak and Metro train lines. If you look at the stone wall below it, see the circle of the stone wall? Those are vents. There's fans being in there, letting air out from the trains that were right underneath River Point. The newest addition to our skyline, directly to your right, World Point South, also known as Salesforce Tower. It's a brand new office building, which still puts some finishing touches on it. And to the left of it, that green building is World Point West, apartment building from 2016. Most of the buildings we'll see today are either apartments or office buildings. I'll give you a little trick to help tell the difference. If you happen to see any windows cracked open or balconies, it's probably an apartment building. If there are no windows cracked open or balconies, it's probably an office building. Straight ahead now, that shorter peach-colored brick building is the oldest building we'll talk about on the river today. The Fulton House is from 1898. It was originally a freezer for the meat packing industry. They slaughtered cattle and stacked right around the city, bringing them here to be frozen and shipped on a hot train. Then in the 1970s, an architect named Perry Weiss oversaw a redesign and turned it into apartments. They say when the meatpacking industry moved out, it took the Fulton House three months to fall out. Straight ahead, this bridge sticking up in the air is the Carroll Street Railroad Bridge, 1908. This bridge is the landmark. It's no longer in use, so we always leave it in the upright position. It gives a nice demonstration of how these movable bridges work. By a movable bridge, I mean they can raise. The technical term for this type of bridge is a trunnion fascule bridge. Fancy word for seesaw. On the back of the bridge is the big concrete block. That's the counterweight. When the block goes down, the bridge stands up. All 37 of our movable bridges have counterweights like that. And most of them are buried on the side, but you cannot see them. They still do raise the bridges from time to time, mostly in the late spring to allow sailboats to get out to the lake. They do the scheduled times on Wednesday and Saturday mornings. So if you're, if you're ever hanging out downtown and you see a group of sailboats just kind of waiting around, you're probably waiting for one of these bridges to raise. On your left, these pointy residences are the River Cottages, 1988, designed by Harry Weiss, the same architect who redesigned the Fulton House. He was a big fan of sailing. The whole building is shaped like a sail. And those circular windows are like the four holes on a ship. Everyone thought Harry Weiss was crazy for this one, not just for the odd triangular shape of the building, but for the fact he wanted to put residences on the river at all. And as recently as 1988, when these were built, the river was still industrial. Smelly. Not a lot of people wanted to live by the river. In the long term, though, Harry Weiss was right. A few years ago, one of those four units sold for $2.25 million. The river is now so it out of real estate in the So, our Kathy Kane's going to do a U turn.
And you probably noticed ahead on the right, there's a building with a Y-shaped foundation. See how that one pinches together at the bottom? Now, why would you want to build a foundation like that? It's a tricky spot to put a skyscraper. That lot's set empty for many years. Because they had to find a way to fit a foundation in between two things. On the one side, there's Amtrak and Metro trains underneath. On the other side, a city zoning law required them to leave 30 feet of space between the river and the front of the building for public access. And the city wants people hanging out by the river. So they had to squeeze that foundation into only 20% of the lot space. The first full-size floor of that building is about 100 feet off the ground. Now, how do you do that safely? A lot of concrete. You ever see those rotating concrete trucks? It took about 500 of those for the foundation for this building. 150 North Riverside. Also, just kind of a fun trick, if you look up in the angled glass, you're going to see a reflection of our boat. See if you can spot yourself in the reflection up there. Yeah, it's a good looking boat. Here's what we're talking about our second method of sway reduction. Now we call them down skyscrapers swaying in the breeze. Now you won't be able to see them, but on the top floor of this building to your right, there are 12 tanks holding 160,000 gallons of water. Basically, whenever the wind makes the building sway one way, all the water in those tanks on the top floor sloshes the other way, and helps reduce the amount of time it takes the building to settle. Which is important, because that's an office building, and that can mean the difference between hitting reply and accidentally hitting reply all. Tanks of water on the top floor are called two inertial slosh dampers. For any inertia, that water slosh back over. On your left, the Bank of America building, 2020. This building costs around $800 million to construct. You see it's got these blue ridges running up the side. Those help shave off the wind step by step. Those are very reflective glass. The Bank of America building had to deal with that same city zoning law requiring them to leave 30 feet of space between the river and the front of the building. You can see how they dealt with columns along the bottom of the building. In between the tops of those columns, there are carvings. Those bar reliefs tell the story of the written word from the hieroglyph to the Gutenberg Redeemers. So this is Art Deco, fancy style from the Roaring Twenties. Now at the end of the Roaring Twenties, we had the Great Depression and then World War II. And those 20 years or so are kind of a gap in the architectural record. We're not building a lot of new big office buildings. So when we emerge in the post-war period, heading into the 1950s and 60s, those world-changing experiences have changed our mindset. That's you get a new style called Black Box Modernism. On your right, Gateway 1 from 1965, and Gateway 2 from 1960s. Black Box Modernism is also the most famous building in Chicago. You see the top corner to your left there, the Willis, hopefully Sears Tower. We'll get a much better view of the Willis Tower on the way back, and I'll talk about it for a long time. These men actually coined the phrase, less is more. Keep it simple. Each of these black box buildings has three basic ingredients. Skeleton, skin, and space. The skeleton is the steel frame on the inside that is the most important hole in the building. The skin is the outside, this is what we call a curtain wall, as opposed to a low bearing wall. Other buildings might have more stone or brick along the outside, bearing the load of the building. In this case, the steel skeleton on the inside does that. Rest 
the 50s and 60s of black box modernism, culminating in the biggest black box of all, the Sears Tower, 1974. For the rest of the 70s and 80s, the river's still industrial and stinky, but that would change. In the 90s and early 2000s, as the river gets cleaner, the more residential buildings on the river, like 2009, Trump Tower, second tallest building in Chicago. 2012, I visit Chicago for the first mustache, Cody. <laughs> You guys have a good time today! Yay! Fantastic. Thank you so much. You guys have been a great audience. We have one more treat this last turn.